So good evening, everyone. Good evening, Father. Yes. Happy weekend. Thank you, Father. Father. Thank Today, you, Father. beautiful day. Happy new month to you all. God bless and make Thank this month you, a Father. one for us in Jesus' name. Amen. So today we are moving very fast the, there is no much activity in them um, chapters 10 and 11 so should be a very brief one maximum for the five minutes we should be done with the study of genesis chapters 10 and 11. i hope you can all see my screen and you can hear me you can hear me loud and clear yes father we can see your screen and we can hear you loud and clear thank you for that feedback so let us pray in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Father, anoint me with the Holy Spirit, yes. so that in studying your Amen. eternal word, you may Amen. penetrate my whole being, transform, transform me. me. Grant, Grant me the blessing me. to be a faithful disciple of your word. 
Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. So these are the learning objectives for today. At the end of this lesson, you should be able to explain the significance of the table, the table of the nations. That's what uh, chapter 10 is about. It's a genealogy table, and we call it the table of the nations. And um, you should recognize its, its, its representation or its significance as God's, you know, a, as a connection to God's salvific purpose for the whole world. And at the end of this lesson, you should be able to examine the, the character of, of Nimrod. There is a particular character in chapter 10 that we need to study. That's the most important person in that, chap in that chapter, Nimrod. Is the first monarch and the implication of his of his actions his actions led to um the the tower of babel in, in chapter 11. so chapter chapters 10 and 11 are um are together they are connected by this figure nimrod and at the end of this day you should also be able to analyze the disobedience portrayed by the sons of men i'm sure you are familiar with the term sons of men um um in the tower in the story of the tower of babel and lastly you should be able to consider the theological aspect of god coming down twice we were told that god came down to see what the sons of men were building um in babel so we should be able to consider the the theology of god coming down from from heaven and we'll proceed using this outline um the table of the nations nimrod the first monarch the tower of babel then a summary of of both chapters so let's go to the first one the table of the nations hopefully we've all read chapters 10 and 11. chapter 10 is not that interesting because it comes with all of these these names of of the descendants of the three children of of uh, of noah um Japheth, Ham and 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 um, what's the name of that third one? Shem, Japheth Ham and Shem. And um, by now you should know that we are in the new era, a new creation. Um, the era of Noah and his descendants mark a new era for humanity. The era of Cain, you know, you know, we were coming from Adam to Cain. The era of Cain has failed. Community. Um, someone's uh, microphone is. I want to mute everybody. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. So, the era of Cain faded, culminating in the vengeful Lamech. I will remember Lamech, uh, the one who sought vengeance 77 times. Uh, remember that Cain and his descendants were referred to as the sons of men. This, this idea of the sons of men will also come up in, in chapters, chapters 10 and, and 11. And um, um, then Seth and his descendants worshipped God and they end the name sons of God. They end the name sons of God. Yeah, please, just a minute, let me control something that is going on in my back so sorry about that they um they are doing some works of repairs behind me so i just have to caution them to bring out the noise so that it doesn't disturb me so the sons of king the descendants of king we are referred to as the sons of men the descendants of of set worshipped god and they end the name sons of god they brought forth a new era which then ended with the flood then noah 
is then chosen and from him we have this chapter 10 the table the word is now populated by or repopulated by the descendants the descendant of of noah okay from noah and his three children that's what we are seeing in chapter 10. so in the previous chapter you remember god had commanded or blessed them or made a covenant with noah a new covenant and he told him be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth so this feeling of the earth is what we see in this table of nations so rather than following the usual um, this is the father of these this is the father of that father son table of genealogy it defines um, the boundaries of how these different people these different tribes these different families are occupying and filling the new world that god is creating so god assigned a place for each tribe or family and also gave them a task a task to to yeah to do a family of hunters a family of farmers um, and different 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 tasks like that and responsibilities and this makes me feel that every human family has its own uniqueness and purpose on it every family in their family name talent and business they contribute immensely to the advancement of the universe and we have to harness it to make the world a better place and i usually tell my my boys here in school that they must ensure that they learn the family business they learn the family trade okay of course socialization begins from the family and socialization is when a child becomes aware of the society and contribute to the growth of the society so by learning the family business i know what my father does uh, because i grew with him i helped him in his in his work i could also you know also do the same work i i also know what my my mom does uh, she trades and i could help her you know in her trade and even create a trade for myself and with that we are contributing to to the society okay if you come from the family of traders fashion designers drummers doctors lawyers you are born into these professions and they become so natural to you and and the best part is that you don't even have to to when you learn them you don't even have to go to school to learn them or to pay for them so every family has a gift for their children to help them sustain you know the society sometimes it's even different from what the what the child is going to go to school to to study so the the, the family is the first school and we hand over a tradition to our children and that's why every child has a right to a family every child has a right to father to mother and that's why parents should not should not take away this right from their children by encouraging divorce parent there is nothing like single parenthood the only one acceptable is perhaps maybe one of the one of the uh one of the spouses um is 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 late okay is diseased but divorce is not is not part of god's plan for for the family single parenthood is not part of is not part of god's plan for the family so a family is made up of father mother and children and it's a school where the children learn the task and we hand over the purpose okay for which god has designed every family we hand them over to our children so the three sons of noah give rise to 70 nations if you if you count the number of of nations in in chapter 10 they amount to to 70 okay so noah and his children give rise to 70 nations that populate the entire world okay uh, and that's why we call it the table of 70 nations uh, this is significant because god's survivic purpose even under the old covenant has the whole world in view 70 is a perfect number to communicate this seven is means perfect and 10 means whole okay seven means perfect and 10 means whole so seven times 10 meaning 70 that's the whole world the perfect new world in view okay in exodus we have that the number of israelites who came into egypt were 70. okay that's a representation of the whole world 
That's the whole world moving towards salvation. Jesus sent 70 to go and preach. That's also a representation of that Jesus sent them to the whole world. So 70 nations is like a representation of the whole world. Okay? Although the arrangement of this chapter is not chronological, but it, it leads us eventually to Abraham in chapter 11, which will now end the first part of the book of Genesis. Remember, we said the book of Genesis can be majorly divided into two, the primeval history and the patriarchal history. Okay, the primeval history is more or less like a fit narration, which will end in chapter 11. So the, the, the real history will now begin from chapter 12 with, with Abraham. So with this nation, this, this 17 nation will now lead us into this figure called Abraham, who will now become the father of faith, the father of all, all the nations. So from the beginning, God has this, um, this idea of saving the world, okay, communicating with the world, with this number 70 as a representation of that. And in chapter 10, we want to focus on, on Nimrod, who is like a rebel force behind the Tower of Babel in chapter 11. So let's look at chapter 10, verse 6. Chapter 10, verse 6 says that the sons of Ham, Cush, Egypt, Put, and Canaan, and all of those there, you move, let's move to uh, verse, verse, verse 9 or verse 8. Cush became the father of Nimrod, and he was the first on earth to be a mighty man. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Therefore, it is said like Nimrod, a mighty hunter before the Lord. The beginning of his kingdom was Babel. You see that this, this figure was the one who, who, who created that idea of the Tower of, of Babel. So this is the tree of Ham's descendants. And you could see that many of them are like the future enemies of Israel. And you remember that, that Ham was, cursed, was the cursed son of, of Noah in chapter, in chapter 9. Okay, chapter 9, verse 25. Chapter 9, verse, verse 24. When Noah woke up from his wine and learned that what his youngest son, that is Ham, had done to him, he said, Cursed be Canaan, the lowest of slaves, shall he be to his brothers. Okay, so the descendant of Ham, Canaan, was cursed. So he was cursed because he embarrassed his father by seeing his nakedness. And he mocked him by telling his brothers. So the curse really followed him. And he gave birth to the enemies of Israel, like Egypt, Canaan, and Philistines. Okay? They created cities of men like Babylon, Assyria, and Nineveh, and so on. And this got me thinking, like, let's be careful of what we say to our children. As parents, okay, the first thing you should do when you wake up in the morning, I enjoyed that so much from my own parents, Immediately my mom wakes up, the first thing is to call us by name and she begins to bless us and pray for us, okay, before our general prayer. So she wakes us up, she will call your name, all the names, you know, Yoruba people, we, we can bear so many names. I have like six, seven names. So she will start itemizing all the names one after the other, okay, while waking you up, like summoning you into life, into existence in God and blessing you at the same time, first thing in the morning. Okay, so you should bless them, call them by their names and pray for them. And no matter how they get you angry, do not ever curse them. Because it's very powerful for, for a parent, you know, to curse, to curse, to curse the child. Mm. And just as just as Noah did with Ham and his old descendant um, are suffering for that. You see, they 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 created a world of a world um that is that is that against the children the sons the sons of god against the children of god egypt um canaan philistine we just read about philistine some weeks back during the mass uh, that's where we david and goliath and, and all of those babylon who will eventually come and sack 
come and sack Israel. Assyria, all these are tough men. Nineveh, thank God Nineveh repented when Noah, um, I said Noah, what was his name? Jonah. Jonah. Let's go to the next one. Okay, so let's look at that figure, Nimrod. Again, it says Cush was his father and he was the first mighty man. Okay, was a mighty hunter before the Lord, and it was his be the beginning of his kingdom was Babel. So Nimrod, special attention is given to this figure. Um uh, because even the Bible gives us a little detail about him. So this means that that means all of these names in chapter 10. The author wants us to pay attention, more attention to him. So the word, the name Nimrod means we will rebel or let us, let us rebel. Let us, okay, let us come together and rebel against, against the Lord. Okay, so Nimrod becomes a type. For a while now we have been seeing the types of Christ, the types of, the types for the church. Okay, but now we have a type that is anti God's kingdom. Okay, he was the first man to conquer all the kingdoms. He was the first type of, of man who wanted to rule, the, to rule the world. And he represents all of the attributes of, of the men who wanted to rule and conquer the world. He conquered Babylon, he conquered Assyria, Nineveh at their earliest stage of, of their existence. And these are cities in opposition to the people of God. So history has as many in his footsteps, like Pharaoh, Antiochus, Epiphanes, Nero, Hitler, to name but a few. And this is going to culminate in the idea of this Antichrist in the New Testament. So he wanted to be the, the first man to rule the earth. Why the Antichrist will want to be the last man to rule, to rule the earth before the second coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So this man wanted to build that world empire, the first world ruler. And was trying to unite the world around him. He elevated himself. So the meaning of his name, with the meaning of his name and the kind of city he built, they, they give us a hint to how we should interpret the next statement. That he was a mighty hunter before God. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. So the context shows that this is not a commendation. Okay? That it is not talking about Nimrod's ability to hunt wild games, to hunt animals. He was not a hunter of animals. He was a hunter of men. Okay? A warrior. It, it was through his ability to fight, to kill, and to rule ruthlessly that his kingdom was built and consolidated. So let's go to chapter 11. And Nimrod, you know, started this whole idea of let us rebel against, against the status quo and let us build a nation for, for ourselves. So as we enter chapter 11, we want to remember that God has just given Noah and his family a very clear directive to go forth, spread, and repopulate the earth, to be fruitful and multiply. But this Tower of Babel, that Nimrod will lead in building is a direct rebellion to the command to that commandment of God. In verse one, we read that the um, now the whole earth has one language and few words, and as men migrated from the east, they found a plain in the land of Shina and settled there. One language. If we accept the biblical teaching that mankind has a common origin in Adam then this simply makes sense. That there was a time when humanity spoke one language instead of hundreds of, of languages that we have on earth today. But the question is, what language were they speaking? Was it Hebrew or some semantic language from which Hebrew will later come? Or was it Yoruba or Hausa or Hebrew? But I would recommend that we call it the language of love, the language of unity. And that's the only language that can foster, that can foster unity. Yeah. But what is actually incredible is that linguists, um, linguists cannot explain the origin of languages other than reference to a divine intervention. 
Yes, they are able to explain the dynamic nature of language, how one language came forth from another. But the beginning of languages itself remains a mystery that eludes them. So Shina was a term used also to refer to Babylon. If you read chapter 10, verse 10, which says that his kingdom originated in Babylon, Erek and Akka, all of them in the land of Shina. Okay, so Shina is more or less like in Babylon. Oh, sorry, Babylon was more or less like in Shina. So we can we can say we can use the term inter interchangeably. So Babylon is known for rebellion against against God. So the multiplied descendant from from Ham came together to build a great city and Thor in rebellion against God's commandment. You know, God's commandment was spread out. But now they say, come, let us, let us come together and settle here in this land. That's, that's a direct disobedience to God's command that says, go out and populate the whole world. Verse 3, and they said to one another, come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they add brick for stone and bitumen for, for mortar. Okay, that statement, burn them thoroughly, means that they wanted to build something that, that will last. And that's very human. We make long-lasting plants, and God will just come in and scatter everything. We'll make plants for ourselves. Uh, something will just happen and it scatters everything. We see it as scatter anyway, but it's it's divine intervention. Okay? God wants to properly order us into to, towards the direction for which he, he had created for us. So using baked bricks and bitumen for mortar means that they wanted to build a tower that was both strong and waterproof. Okay? And this also shows that man... Or the sons of men did not believe it when God when God promised never to to use flood to destroy the earth. So they were building something that is both strong and waterproof to protect man against maybe when when the rain or the flood comes again. So they were not believing that God will be faithful to His promise of never to destroy to destroy the earth with water, and that's very typical of us as children of men forgetting that we are actually sons and daughters of god let's move forward verse four and then they said come let us build let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens and let us make a name for ourselves lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole world so come let us make a city let us build ourselves a city lest we'll be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth that's a direct disobedience to god's command for them to to go forth and repopulate the whole world okay a tower whose top is in the heavens this means that so that when the rain comes they will go up there and be saved so they are not still believing that God will, will not destroy the earth the second time with, with water. So they were trying to build a monument of heaven here on earth, a tower that can match the heights of heaven, a monument to really have heaven within it. And, and of course, they were worshipping there. They were worshipping creation rather than, rather than the creator. And there is this rough portrait that I... I put on this on the screen there okay that tries to imitate the monument of an ascending kind of staircase that's wrapped around you know the structure and at the top of the structure you will find altars and these shrines that are dedicated to various to various gods and by the way the word babel originally meant the gate of the gods the word babel means the gates of the gods. so they, they were building a gate <laughs> to worship not the creator, but the creatures who they will now start naming as gods. The god of the star, the god of the moon. So the idea is that they are building the Torah and it's going to be a place of worship, a place of worshipping the, 
the creation in heavens, not the creator of heaven, but the creation. That is the stars, the moon, the constellations, and, and, and what have you. So we can say that Babel is then the birthplace of astronomy. And we can equally say it's the birthplace of, of, of polytheism or pantheism, which is the worship of, of multiple gods. So that idea of let us make a name for ourselves, it, it, it's, it's almost like Genesis chapter chapters 2 and 3. Okay? You will be like God. Let us, let us, let us be autonomous. Let us do away with God. We don't need God here. Let us do it our way. Okay? If you were a Nimrod, for instance, you wanted to build an empire, you need two things. You need one, the headquarter. And that's what the Torah in Babel represents. That's the headquarter. And you also need a motive, a team to make people gather around you. Like the benefits. What is in it? What is in it for the people? And what is in it for them is they want to make a name for themselves. So God, since God does not want us in heaven, since God has abandoned us, let's show him that we can ascend heaven on our own. And that's why they built that tower. Let's show him we can go up to heaven. We can, we can match his height up there. And here we have the first religion, okay? Meaning walking our way up to God by our own effort, devout of, of God's assistance. This is false religion. That is man trying to ascend himself, ascend by himself to God. And many religions follow this precept. Okay? Man walking his way up to God, devout of God's grace, devout of God, God's effort. And that's why they, they feel that um, it is by their effort they can get favor from God. When I fast, in exchange for that fast, God will favor me. That's not, that's not the way God works. That's, that's false religion. Okay, fasting is, is even for us, it's for us to align ourselves to God's will. Okay, uh, it's for our benefit, not so that we can manipulate God into tricking Him to do what, what we want Him to do for us. Okay, Christianity is different. Christianity is, is God walking His way down to man. Unlike other religion, their religion is man walking, struggling his way to God. Our own life is God. We celebrate God walking his way down to us through Christ. Okay? Christianity is based on what God has done, not what we will do. It is based on what God has done for us. Okay? It is, we, we earn favor from what God has done not from what we we do then it is it is from what god has done for us that we are enabled to do things for others and that's the that's the difference between faith faith and works our work ordinarily is not what brings us favor okay it is what god what brings us grace is what god has done and from what God has done for us, we have now been graced to do things, to bear that fruit of good works unto others. And that's also the problem that, that the protestants usually have. They stop at, ah, God has done everything for us, so, so there's no need for us to do things ourselves. Okay? You know, but for us Catholics, we want to balance it. Yes, God has done everything, but he has given us the grace so that we too can do good things. And that is why faith and works, they complement each other. Next slide. Okay, verse 5. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower, which the sons of men had built. You can see now, this is true religion. Why do we are struggling to go up to heaven? God just saw them and he came down. You don't have to, you don't have to stress yourself, Okay. This is what true religion entails. God coming down to enter our world, to order it appropriately. Another man, Eve, experienced you know, this every evening. And, okay, 
every evening, you know, in the cool of the evening, God will come to them to sit with them, to chat with them, to eat with them. And, and that's my opinion. Probably they were sharing a meal. No wonder Christ instituted the, the Eucharist in the evening. Perhaps they were celebrating Mass every evening. God will just come and celebrate Mass with them. Okay. But this building, this tower, though very insignificant to God physically, however, God's action is very important. That God is condescending and coming down to man's level, as of course he will ultimately do in the person of in the second person, our Lord Jesus Christ, in the incarnation. So God must have been heartbroken about what is fascinating to man at this point, instead of his glory. Okay. The sons of God, I mean, the son of God, that's what Saint Irenaeus said. The son of God became the son of man so that the children, the sons and daughters of man can become children, children of God. And that is supposed to be what is what should be fascinating to us. Most times we are fascinated by what we can do rather than bask in the glory of God or the glory of the one who gives us the power to do what we can do. So they were trying to create a city that, that, that um, God is absent. And they wanted to do it on their own. And God would just have come and said, no, this is not the way. And that's why God scattered them. And you see how God referred to them as the sons of men. The sons of men. And we have been seeing the, the theme of the sons of men versus the sons of God over and over again in these first few chapters of Genesis. It is afraid that designates those who are not on the side of, of God's history. Okay? We see it in the descendants of Cain, the sons of men who built the city of man, versus the descendant of Seth who walked with God and built the city of God where God is worshipped. So now we have the descendants of Ham, referred to as the sons of men, and they are really building a city a city of man. Verse 6. And the Lord said, Behold, they are one people, and they have the and they have all one language. And this is only the beginning of what they can do, and nothing that they propose to do will now be impossible for them. This is the power of man. But the, it, what God seem in court to be afraid of now is, yes, man has the power, but he is disordered. The, he, the power to do things is not well ordered. What they are doing right now is, is disordered. Instead of them to unite and do something great, they are doing something that will destroy themselves. So if the activities of man are left unchecked, then they can once again destroy themselves. Any nation devoured of God is set for destruction. And God is asking himself, what should I do? What should we do to rescue them? And the answer is in verse 7. Verse 7. In verse 7, God says, Come, let us go down and there confuse their language. Let us, let us go down. This is a language, this is a Trinitarian language. Okay? It shows that the works of salvation is Trinitarian. And we've come across this before in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, when God said, let us create man in our image, the plurality of persons in God. So here, the idea is that um, Babel's arrogance, let us go up. You know, they were building a tower to go. See, let us go up and go and match God and go and, you know, show God that we can reach up the scars on our own so this arrogance is now countered by heaven's response of let us come down god is now dialoguing with himself again let us come down and come and save these people from from self-destruction i usually like that statement of god when god is speaking in pure let us it shows the inner principle of god and this is what we call the you know i told us when we were studying genesis chapter one that we have two ways of knowing God. We have the we have the theologia and we have the economia. The first one is the theologia means the nature of God, knowing God in his nature. That is the Trinity 
um, the persons in God. Okay, but your economia is like the economy of God's salvation, the works of God, which is tripartite, creation, um, uh, salvation, that's redemption and sanctification. So when God is speaking, let us, he's, he's acting in his nature, his true nature is Trinitarian, plurality of persons, though one. Okay, so God is dialoguing with himself. Now let us, let's go and save these people. Who are about to destroy themselves so god's coming down to us is the only way that we can then go up to god not on our own on our own we will not we will not do it very well we will be disordered in doing it it will lead us into worshiping false gods but god had to come down that's why saint irene will say the son of god became the son of man so that we by that can now rise okay to to becoming children to becoming children of god and it's, it's just a way of saying like the psalmist that if the lord does not build the house in vain do the laborers labor okay so the lord scattered them abroad okay this first separation of men from babel was more of god's mercy god's act of saving them from the destruction so god was dividing them both linguistically and geographically to put a check on the power of his fallen nature, of man's fallen nature, which, if united, could lead to more destruction. Eleven verse eight. Therefore, its name was called Babel, because the Lord confused the language of all the earth, and from there the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of all the earth. Like I told us that initially, Babel means the gates of the gods, okay? So now, Babel means confusion, meaning that the, the gates of the gods, <laughs> if you enter it, leads to confusion. The worship of false gods leads to confusion. That's what this is telling us. And again, we are back in that circle of men. Man fails, God judges, God's mercy, God start all over again. Uh, and where does it start this time around? Okay, after after the after the the genealogy of, of the sons of men through Ham, we will now start having the genealogy of the sons of God through who? Who was the one that um, Noah passed passed the the blessing of the promise to? That's Shem. Okay, so Shem, God, the, the next the next line of of text will have after Babel, which is the city of God, are those who we now start building uh, city of man, are those who we now start building the city of God, the line of the descendants of Shem. Okay, and that's what we have in verse twenty seven. Now these are the descendants of from verse 10 let's just say from 11 from verse 10 these are the descendants of shem and we have all of those up until verse 26 when terah was 70 years old he begot abraham okay now this from this single man now god will now have a city of faith a city of god these are the descendants of terah terah begot abraham and all of those there okay mm, the most important thing now here is that we we are we we see the mention of familiar people here like abraham soon to be abraham we see lot we see abraham's that's abraham's nephew we see sarah which soon to be sarah so abraham will be known as the father of faith the father of nations not because it was he has a perfect faith that like we'll begin to see from next week or we'll begin to treat chapter 12 okay not because he has a perfect faith but because he was willing to learn and grow in his faith he was willing to learn and i i recently encountered someone who who did not believe in the eucharist a catholic and she's struggling with her faith and she was telling me that most people receive communion, not like her, that they are only pretending. They don't really believe in what they receive. 
And that's why you just see people just go there and just go and receive to fulfill all righteousness. And I was telling her that that is also an act of faith. Faith doesn't have to be to be hundred percent, okay? That you even have the courage to stand, okay, and go and receive. It's an act of faith, even though it's imperfect. It's better than you who does not have faith at all. Okay, so faith grows, and that's why when when Jesus said. Um, to them that they should pray that their faith should increase to his disciples lord increase our faith okay uh that's that's the prayer of, of of a true disciple okay so abraham is the father of faith not because he was perfect but because he was willing to journey with god to allow god lead he he learned and he, he grew in the faith and if you read that aspect it already gives us a clue into the family of abraham and the journey to the promised you know, to the promised land of, of Canaan. And Abraham, you see, the, the land of Canaan has already been promised from the beginning, but they will not get there until, you know, later they will pass through Exodus and and the book of uh, all of those books, Deuteronomy, Leviticus, and the book of Joshua, uh, before they will finally settle down in, in Canaan. But it has been promised from the time of, from, from the time of Abraham, okay? Abraham was to go to Canaan alone, but he took the whole family. He took his dad, Terah. And <laughs> unfortunately, Terah means delay, okay? He took Terah, delay, and perhaps that was what delayed him because they finally got stuck in Haran. And Haran, the city where Abraham said to, Abraham was to journey from all straight to Canaan, okay? which it was the promised land. Now, he, he was to go alone. He took Terah, his father, Lot, his nephew. And all of these people will cause him problem in the end. Okay? So Terah meaning delay. And they got to Haran. He got stuck. And Haran also mean barren. And people were trying to link him. Maybe that was why, okay, Sarah was barren too. And so it, it, it's almost like the consequence of partial obedience is delay and barrenness. When God gives you a command, you should obey. If he says, go dear, go. And uh, don't, don't compromise. So, and this, this, this is more or less like an answer to our many spiritual ills. Okay? And we need to ask ourselves, are there any thought of pride we are erecting, blocking us from experiencing God? Okay, we want to we want to do away with um, with it. We want to do away with it. We want to surrender to God totally. And finally, uh, this is me just doing a quick summary of what we've just learned um, of chapters ten and eleven. I consider it very important for us Christians because in the preceding chapter, God um, calibrated. Or in chapter 10, God calibrated uh, landed properties for all the nations. And of course, the human desire is insatiable. Man begins to move away from where God had planted him, perhaps looking for a greener pasture. Okay, unable to find satisfaction. So he chooses to settle down at Shina, that's Babel, okay, to build a prideful city at the site of their own choosing, different from where God had planted them. So and pride, they say, goes before a fall. Perhaps the main purpose of scattering them was so that they could, they could return to their God-given lands. You know, when God scattered them again um, after Babel, perhaps that was to, so that they can return to where God originally planted them. Because God does not act out of ignorance or without purpose. He planted them here. They said, no, we don't want it. Let us gather in Babel. Let us build this city. God scattered them so that they can return back to the original place where he, he planted it. So sometimes we too, we wander aimlessly, looking for what is not lost. Most times, all it takes to our progress in life is to plant ourselves in one place, act for God's direction, and learn to blossom, to bloom where we are planted. 
And the, the story of the Tower of Babel is also an indication that technological advancement can either make or mar humanity. Okay, from the beginning, God willed that man should harness the world's resources and power for his own good, but to the glory of God the Creator. However, the problem begins when man yearns to make a name for himself, when there is no bracket, when there is no check to what science is doing. And man will, will, will you know, will head for, for damnation, for destruction. Come, let us make bricks and build for ourselves a city and a tower. Okay, when technology reaches a point where man no longer feels the need for God, he is heading for doom. Uh, this refusal to accept one's place as human in the universe under God's leadership is still very much with us even today, either as individual or as a country or or the universe as a whole. Okay, yeah, confusing their speech is, is punishment for their pride, and there is always a punishment for a proud for a proud man or a woman. And remember, we are created out of dust. Um, a man was created, and, and that's why the word, the word man, humanity, and humility, they share the same root word. And the Latin word humus, meaning soil. So, uh, or humilis, meaning low. So humility means bringing oneself down to the ground. And humanity, therefore, means made from the soil. So by nature, man is humble. Anytime man begins to appropriate power to himself, pride, okay, and arrogance, meaning he's acting in contradiction to his, to his nature. And that is, that is self-destructive. So if there's anybody who is proud here, let him bring himself, his, his or herself down before he falls. There is always a fall after pride. So we we'll continue with the man who is humble, Abraham, who listens to God, who is obedient to God, and they call him the friend of God in the next class. Yes, I thought it was going to be very short today. So any question? Yes, next week we'll do chapter 12. And by the grace of God, hopefully, in the next ten lessons, we'll be able to finish. Should be able to finish the book of Genesis. I can't wait to start Exodus. Exodus is my favorite, or one of my favorite. Very interesting. So from chapter twelve, now we'll be dealing with, with, with history. Okay, um, history in the sense that we have evidence or evidences of the of the existence of this figure called Abraham in the books of history, even the ones that are not Christian, even the ones that are not even uh, from, that are not even religious, that there is a figure called Abraham. We have evidences here and there. Uh, and it's, it's, it gets better from here. We'll begin to see a lot of a lot of typology, uh, like in chapter fourteen, where we'll encounter figures like Melchizedek. So, any question? And let's call it a day. Tomorrow is Sunday, which has already started from today. I told somebody I posted something on my status this evening that happy Sunday, and somebody was looking so surprised that ah. Uh -uh, Father, today is not Sunday yet now. Wait till tomorrow. And I was laughing that my students in Bible study, they already know what is what I'm what I'm talking about. And there was evening and there was morning the first day. Okay. The day starts in the evening. And tomorrow, which is Sunday, starts today in the evening. Every solemnity follows suit. So any question? I was fortunate to go 
to see one of us last week when I went for mass at Saint Saint Anthony, and he's one of our one of our sponsors. I was so happy seeing him. God will continue to bless. I'm not sure he's online today, and I think his wife is is online. She's usually the one that scores 19 over 20 in our test. God bless you. So any question for me so that we can go and rest and prepare for, for worship tomorrow? Oh, okay, he traveled. Hey, yeah. Of course, he's going to get the, um, the link to the recording of this of this class so thank you very much for joining us see us next week god bless all of you um i hope you are taking notes and you are marking your bibles so that next time when you open it you don't have to listen to the lecture again you can just be reminded of what we have done today so glory be yes, to the father, father and to the son and to the holy spirit as it, As was, it in was in the beginning, it's now, it's and now. shall be all without end. Amen. The Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Good, Good night, night, Father. Good night, Father. Good night, Father.